Well, good morning. Welcome to Estonia, where uh, a month ago we celebrated the 20th anniversary of our independence version 2.0. When uh, Estonia re-established its sovereignty after a half century of successive thuggish totalitarian occupation, first by the Soviets, then the Nazis, then again the Soviets, we knew that getting out of all that we wanted to create a democratic country characterized by rule of law and respect for human rights. The rules for that were fairly clear. All we had to do was read uh, Charles-Louis Montesquieu, John Locke, Thomas Jefferson, and John Stuart Mill. Um, at least they, uh, in addition to the intellectual sources, there were lots of role models from the preceding two centuries to emulate, and as well as uh, plenty of lessons on what not to do, since we'd seen that up front and close. But after the Soviet, the other problem after the uh, Soviet era was that um, it wasn't simply lack of democracy, but it was also that we were poor, very poor. In terms of economic reforms, we also knew what needed to be done, that is to restore the market economy. And here there were many more tried and true models to follow liberal or what is today called neoliberal market economies, a more social market or Erhartian approach, or perhaps a Scandinavian social welfare model. Each had its pluses and minuses. While the uh, electorate has consistently opted for the more liberal approach, it is clear we would not be charting new ground but rather applying our reading or misreading of Hayek or Keynes, Friedman or Samuelson. The real issue for me, at least, was how sustainable could a country of 1.4 million, roughly the size of the Danish capital, Copenhagen, be? Indeed, Copenhagen is not an appropriate comparison because a municipal government of roughly the same size in population, is free of the requirements of statehood. A city does not need a diplomatic service or embassies. It doesn't need an army, a navy, or a border guard, a health care system, or a tax authority. It doesn't need a full-time parliament or a supreme court. It need not field troops in Afghanistan. It need not emit its own currency or maintain an Olympic team. In other words, the requirements of statehood are far greater than mere numerical comparison of population size would suggest. People have an unbelievable desire to have their own flag, their own currency, their own airline, their own language, said Madeleine Albright in 1995, talking about the plethora of states that came out of the out of communism. But the question that we faced here in Estonia was whether these desire, desires were sustainable for a nation of our size. In other words, the problem was not Copenhagen, but rather, to use a, an expression used by Francis Fukuyama, getting to Denmark, which was his his short explanation of what a successful nation state was big. Where, to quote now Fukuyama, where Denmark stands generically for a developed country with well-functioning state institutions. We, we know what Denmark looks like and something about how the actual Denmark came into being historically, but to what extent is that knowledge transferable to countries as far away historically and culturally from Denmark as Somalia and Moldova, he asked, unquote. Now, of course, Denmark had gotten to us, invading Estonia in the beginning of the 13th century, and even got their flag, the Donnebro, less than a kilometer from right here in 1219 in a battle against us Estonians on what today is the dome hill of the old city. But we still had a long way for us to get to Denmark. Ladies and gentlemen, this briefly encapsulates the real problem faced by a small country struggling to climb out of the ruins of totalitarian rule, 
poverty and general backwardness. Our fundamental existential question, after having resolved the issues of democracy and economy, was can a country as small as we make it? My own personal answer to this, an answer I would begin pushing and push to this day, came from the reverse reading of a book. I didn't say perverse, I said reverse reading of a book. <laughs> Though some might say that it was a perverse reading of the book. But the book was called The End of Work, which some of you may have read, uh, by the American economist Jeremy Rifkin. In that book, Rifkin argued that computerization and automatization would lead to massive unemployment and impoverishment because people would no longer have jobs. Machines and computers would do everything for them. The argument was neo-Luddite and neo-Marxist. And the one example he used, the most powerful example he used in the book, actually gave me my aha, or eureka moment. Rifkin writes in his book about a steel mill in Kentucky in the United States that produced X amounts of steel with 12,000 employees. After being bought by the Japanese, and being automatized, the plant produced the same amount of steel, but with only 120 employees, 12,120. It was reading that that convinced me how Estonia had to go. It had to computerize. It had to automatize completely. For I realized that reading Rifkin, that actual size is irrelevant. It is functional size that matters. If 120 employees, through computerization and automation, were productively equivalent to 12,000, then Estonia stood a chance of making it in an increasingly globalized world, and if and only if, we were much larger functionally than our numerical size. And so that was more or less how I got to, came to the idea of the Tiger Leap, the plan to computerize and connect all Estonian schools to the internet. That's a plan whose implementation I worked out together with then and also today Minister of Education Jakovic saw in 1995. In brief, it was not the computerization that was the key t uh, to the process. I mean, that's just wires and machines. But it was getting people to want to do it. So we came up with a government matching fund program for municipalities interested in investing in computer education. So, and initially uh, a few were, the ones that had teachers that were most forward-leaning. Uh, and once a few schools got it, then that great motivator of human behavior, envy, on the, on the part of other municipalities, uh, ensured that everyone else followed. So for a poor country like ours to achieve four years later complete internet interconnectivity and computer access for its schools is a story in its own right, but I would rather focus here on the broader picture. The school system actually is, is but a small part of the story, essentially because you, need to, because you do need the nation's youth to be a driver of, your pro of the process and essential too because the young computer whizzes that we wanted to see need the proper environment if you in fact want to produce a Skype as in fact the young computer whizzes did. Today, 98% of Estonians under 35 use the internet regularly and systematically. And this, I submit, represents an altogether different population than a generation ago. A population that already demands an altogether different approach from its government. If the school system is just part of the big picture, which is that information technology and its use by the state and government is at the core of Estonian, Estonia's modernization, one of the most successful modernizations, I would argue, of the past quarter century. ICT, of course, has been the motor of private sector development for the past three decades, and Estonia's Skype is no exception. But the use of ICT in the public sector is where we can genuinely consider Estonia the world's leader. 
the e-government cabinet, e-health services, online voting, online pre-filled tax returns, e-mobile parking are all examples of Estonian innovation, but far more importantly, they are examples of the transformative power of intensive and extensive use of information technology in the public sector. I talk a little bit about what we have done. You'll hear much more about it through, this, through these three days, but just so I can talk later on about what we do in the future, I should talk about what we have done. One of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about is the, a precondition for effective e-public services is inclusiveness. If getting young people computer literate through putting school systems online is a no-brainer, at least in retrospect, then getting older people and those in rural areas, for example, online would be a much tougher nut to crap, crack. Here, serendipitously, perhaps, we did it through a public-private partnership with our banks. Banks realized rather early that electronic banking with electronic uh, banking, branch, branch banking becomes ever more of a cost burden. But how to convince people to bank online? Meanwhile, the government also wanted more people to use the internet for its services. So the two sectors, the public and the private, combined their efforts in an education program, Look at the World, designed to teach older people and people living in the countryside how to use computers and the internet. With local schools opening up their classrooms as well to the general public, as well as municipal administrations providing public access to computers, we achieved in a fairly short time a computer literate population in segments of the populace that elsewhere have been resistant to technological innovation. But the real driver of change has been, have been the services themselves and the changes that underlie a genuine step forward in quality of services offered to people. So the rest of the time I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk about public administration and public services. The first thing to get right is to understand that the internet is not paper. Simple transference of the logic of paper-based administration to HTML is guaranteed to fail. And unfortunately, too many e-government approaches have adopted precisely that. Let's just take what's on paper, we'll put it, it, rewrite it into HTML, put it on the web. You know, sort of the typical thing is you get a form on the computer, then you print it out and fill it out by hand, and then you mail it in. If you want to create a quality e-service on the web, it is necessary to think of the root goals of data collection and its management and think of how to get necessary information to the user slash citizen as quickly and as comfortably as well as securely as possible and to validate this all electronically. This applies to virtually all applications of e-services. In other words, e-government is not about making it possible for people to fill out the same old forms and questionnaires online, but rather is about achieving the goals of administration and services, underlying services, in the most intelligent and citizen-friendly way using the opportunities offered by IT. For example, with the online tax return, we spare the user time and effort by giving him the information that the state already has anyway, which is that uh, who's paid you. Uh, so you get a pre-filled tax form with all the d employer data, the bank information, it's already there. All you have to do as a user is check to make sure it's right, supplement them if necessary, but for the average taxpayer, filling, filing a return in this way becomes a matter of five minutes. And it has been so since 1994. Uh, today, 95 to 98 percent of tax returns are filed online. I shan't go into all of the e-solutions Stony has developed over the years, but it is crucial to note that the cornerstones, the electronic signature, 
and the decentralized data management system we call the X road really lie at the core of the success. I mean, there are other ways of doing things as well, but I would argue that it's the legal signature and the decentralized approach that makes the system in Estonia work. First, the digital signature. It is a universal legally binding method to sign any legal document with notary power. That is to say, as if the, the document were signed on paper with witnesses in the presence of a notary. Without the, legal, without the di digital signature, a public or government service on the web would be taken no more seriously than anonymous internet commentary. Some of you may take it seriously, but most people don't. It lies at the core of the trust necessary for any genuine services on the web. We've built the critical mass of users for the digital signature law was passed in 2000. First with chip-based smart cards and card readers and later with mobile phone-based applications and implementations. The open design of the system helps any public or private application to build on top of the trust that exists between the citizen and the state as a result of the digital signature law and allows the surrounding technologies to evolve over time and not become an incompatible legacy system to deal with as every new technological generation takes over. The other cornerstone is the X road, the backbone of Estonia, the invisible yet crucial link between the nation's various e-services databases, both in the public as well as in the private sector. Our databases and what makes X, the X road system work is that our databases are decentralized. There is no single owner or controller. Every government agency or business can choose the product that's right for them, and new services can be added on one at a time as they become available. The X Road has evolved from a system used merely for making queries to these different queries to these different databases into a tool that can also write to multiple databases, transmit large sets of, of data, and perform searches across several databases. It is what has allowed us successfully to implement the digital health record, the digital prescription, and a number of other things. Similar attempts as standalone digital prescription healthcare records have failed precisely because they have been standalone. There are currently, and what I say about the standalone part is that uh, if each time you want to, you have a new application, be it e-health, digital prescription, taxes. If each time you come up with a new, a new uh, system to deal with it. They, the odds are they will be incompatible. What we have is the, the backbone that works and then the databases are connected to that. So today, uh, today roughly 100 organizations have joined the X Road and are available on there. With, with a universal and open foundation, we have been able to build on it and create new services and products. Uh, most notably, among them, I would start off with internet voting or e-elections, which is a system that allows voters to cast their ballots from any internet-connected computer anywhere in the world. This, by the way, also solves the problem of voting abroad. You don't need embassies to do that. Unrelated to the electronic voting systems used elsewhere, which involve costly and problematic machinery, the Estonian solution is simple, elegant, and secure. I am boasting, but I think it's true. During a, <coughs> during a designated pre-voting period, the voter logs onto the system using an ID card or a mobile ID and casts a ballot. The voter's identity is removed from the ballot before it reaches the National Electoral Commission for counting, thereby ensuring anonymity. In 2005, Estonia became the first country in the world to hold, a na to hold nationwide uh, wide elections using this method, 
And in 2007, it made headlines as the first country to use E or I voting in parliamentary elections. In 2011, uh, the second time we had, uh, we used uh, this system in uh, parliamentary, national parliamentary elections, 24.3% of voters, in other words, a quarter of voters cast their ballots in this way. A second innovation is the e-police system, which is based on the principle that providing the best communication and coordination uh, forms will lead to the most effective policing. It involves two main tools, a mobile workstation installed in each patrol car and a positioning system that shows headquarters each officer's location and status. From uh, simply looking at a passing license plate, Police officers have immediate access to data on the driving license, vehicle, owner, user, and technical inspection information, insurance policies, basic data on the person such as place of residence, photograph, and telephone number. The system is completely integrated into the Schengen's uh, information system, allowing police to see if the vehicle is stolen or if the driver is wanted in another country. These queries, which used to be handled over the radio and took 15 to 20 minutes, that is to say long after the car disappeared, now take as little as two seconds. And the difference allows officers more time to answer calls and resulting in more effective policing and, of course, a declining crime rate. Then we have the, the state or government portal, ASD.ee which is a, a one-stop shop for hundreds of e-services offered by various government institutions. Rather than having to hunt for a particular service on the internet, or in fact go to the office where you have to get the service, um, users, and these include citizens, entrepreneurs, or officials, can simply head to this gateway site and find the appropriate link. Once logged into the system with an electronic ID, the user does not have to repeat the login when accessing each different service. He's just in there and you can do all of your business with the government uh, there. The key, however, to all this remains <coughs> getting the fundamentals right. You need a flexible and decentralized system and you need a legal signature with the attendant's hardware and software. One, and this is not always clear to people, as uh, one visiting delegation impressed with e-elections wanted to implement the e-elections immediately in their country, but asked, please tell us how we can do it without the ID card. The point is you can't do it without the ID card. If you want a safe and secure and user and citizen friendly e-country, you, you can't use shortcuts unless you base it on sound fundamentals, sound foundations, it will not work. Another additional and crucial element that we have discovered is fairly logical, is citizen education. An information society requires, in addition to intelligent e-administration, that is the, the user, the, the provider side, it also requires an informed user, a smart citizen who is capable of making choices. Responsibility for privacy protection, for example, rests much more on the citizen in an e-government e than earlier. If before, with paper administration and services, one went to speak to an official whose task is to offer advice, warn of dangers, ask for identification, and verify one's identity, then an e-administration e-government, the citizen himself is responsible that his ID card is in his possession. He is, he is responsible and required to read and be aware of the consequences of his e-choices. In the e-health portal, for example, he or she decides who is allowed to read his tax records. This is a new kind of relationship where empowerment through the internet also carries with it new responsibilities. But, as I said, I'm not going to talk about what we have already, but try to focus on where, what the future issues will be. 
When discussing development of post-communist countries, I used to paraphrase the opening sentence of Lev Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. And this paraphrase is, all successful countries have reformed alike. All unsuccessful countries find their own excuses. <laughs> I believe that when it comes to ICT in the public sector, we'll go beyond the restriction of post-communist. Successful governments will have implemented broad e-services services solutions. Unsuccessful governments will have failed to do so. Rather than look in the final part of my talk at specific IT public sector solutions, I would look at broader general issues that we all face, that we face them here in Estonia and will be faced in every country that decides to go this route. First of all, a key issue, and I think where e-administration, e-governance is also a, a, a key to overcoming one of the curses of our age, is, um, is really guaranteeing openness and democracy. Absence of transparency breeds corruption. E-tenders, publication of expenses, public sector incomes, and public sector incomes online, uh, all open the governing process to inspection. This is fairly elemental. Perhaps less obvious, but no less important, is that e-governance allows us to eliminate nodes of opaque discretionary and arbitrary decision making, which in plainer language means that administrative decisions that in reality are non-discretionary applications of all sorts, for example, can be done online without anyone arbitrarily having a say in the matter. Or even more bluntly, you can't bribe a computer. No online system will say, I'll process this for a fee. In fact, the best argument for use of ICT in government and the public sector more broadly is the cleansing effect it has. Today in Estonia, corruption remains one of those areas, primarily uh, in municipal government-related uh, areas, that have resisted ICT-based transparency rules regarding all kinds of uh, permits, tenders, and so forth. Whereas at the government level, where we're fairly strict uh, about transparency and require it, uh, the, the amount of corruption has decreased dramatically. And I'm firmly convinced that uh, Estonia's consistent ranking as the uh, most corrupt, at least at the national level of once communist countries, is directly a function of this ICT-based transparency. A second issue we're going to face, and for which at least in Europe, I think means we're going to be forced to deal with uh, ICT, is, I would say broadly, demographic shrinkage, aging, and health, or e-health. ICT means not just better health care, but actually it's going to lead uh, to a transformation of the doctor-patient relationship as we have known it since Hippocrates. With e-health, the relationship is no longer of a priest and a supplicant. ICT allows, indeed forces a revision in the relationship to where the po patient is finally the owner of his own health data. This is open data, which he uses at his own discretion and shows to others, including other doctors, which brings in a new dimension of transparency, oversight, easily obtained, second, third, fourth, or however many medical opinions, and indeed genuine competition, which can only lead to better health care. But of course, ownership of your data also, I think, will and already has been threatening the entire sort of guild system that has been medicine, uh, at least in uh, Europe since the uh, 15th century. One of the growing concerns of Europe is, and Estonia's is really Estonia's own concern of its smallness writ large. And that is our continent's demographic decline and our top-heavy demographic pyramid. We have fewer and fewer children, which, turn, which <clears throat> in turn means having few, fewer future workers to pay the taxes and bear the costs of that burgeoning aging population. 
In addition to forcing Europeans to look ever more towards e-solutions in general, a shrinking workforce and a growing pensioner population will require completely new approaches to healthcare. Currently, I chair the European Commission's task force on e-health, which is comprised of experts from technology, law, medicine, patients' rights, organizations, and so forth, tasked with laying out a future European policy of ICT-based health care. Some solutions are simply logical extensions to a European level of what we already have operating in Estonia. Healthcare records accessible all over Europe with automatic translation, so that a Valletta hospital treating a Finn who falls ill in Malta can access his Helsinki cardiologist observations, or that a Spaniard in Tallinn can refill his digital prescription from his doctor in Toledo. The latter, by the way, is a real example because this, the Spanish go uh, government has instituted the, uh, the ID card in the digital signature and the Spanish ambassador, or who's now gone, but uh, this, the, uh, the last Spanish ambassador used to use our e-prescription system with his Spanish ID card and lamented that when he went back to Spain, they don't, where they don't have a digital prescription system, he won't be able to do that anymore. But in any case, what these, these are examples that uh, simply mean expanding to the EU what we do here. But more challenging is the demographic retiree and quality aging problem. It is clear that current approaches to health care are unsustainable both in terms of cost as well as personnel and quality. E-health solutions that allow people to have their health be monitored, monitored home and not in the hospital, where sensors can pick up dangerous changes in blood pressure, heart rates, and even insulin levels long before patients themselves begin to feel anything, all can lead to improvements in the quality of life as well as extend our lifespans. This is the positive side of moving forward on e-health. We can live longer and better and do it at less cost. The negative side is that not moving on e-health means an increasing Aged population will place ever greater health care burdens in both cost and manpower on a working population decreasing in size and hence with decreasing tax contributions. So I see this as one of the big areas for e-services in the future. Uh, maybe less so in the United States where you don't have this demographic problem of too many old people and not enough workers, but certainly in countries in Europe where this is, affects virtually all of the countries. I mean, I think only Finland does not have a negative birth rate at this point. Uh, all the rest of us do. Uh, it means in the future we're going to be facing lots of problems. The second big issue, which uh, is more of a stumbling block to implementing e-solutions we've discovered here, but much more so in some other countries, I would call the big brother fear. Generally, people's fear and hesitancy regar re regarding greater computerization comes from a George Orwell 1984-based metaphor of a single computer or database where all your information is stored. The computer knows everything about you and can use this information at will. Actually, this is kind of an understandable fear. I mean, it's not as if this is, comes out of the blue. And in fact, if you look at the uh, current discussions of social networks, such as Facebook, the use of cookies and web pages and so forth, um, we can't say that this is a fear, this is a fear that's unwarranted. And uh, those of you who have read uh, Yevgeny Morozov's uh, recent book, um, on the internet, uh, you know that in fact uh, authoritarian and totalitarian regimes have used the social networks to in fact practice precisely the kinds of big brother policies that we're afraid of. So I think that aside from the big brother, I mean aside from what we are trying to do with good governance, the social networks and sale of private data from uh, uh, from cookies and so forth will be an issue of increasing concern and probably regulation in the future. 
But the decentralized citizen-owned databases of the XROAD developed here in Estonia and analogous systems currently under study elsewhere stand in stark opposition to the Orwellian model, though the fears associated with governmental databases appear to be universal. We have implemented here safeguards to guarantee any unauthorized access to data will be caught. Every time a person's data is accessed, it is recorded automatically. Who accesses when, where, and so forth. Those lacking proper authorization, that is, you may be working somewhere where you can get access, but if you really don't have the proper authorization, these, these are automatically flagged. Um, because let's face it, uh, people are people and they will try to pry and find out what other people are doing. Uh, but in fact, the odd thing is that electronic data, in fact, are much better protected than, than paper data. A police officer snooping in her boyfriend's records will be caught when doing so in an electronic database. Um, that's a real case, by the way. So I mentioned we had a police officer who was... Um, but if the, if the records are on paper, well, no one will ever know. You can just go in there, pull out the file cabinet, take out the records, look at it, and put it back. And no one will ever know that it's been looked at. But on, when it's on computer, looking at it will affect the data, uh, and you will be caught. So decentralization and strong watchdog controls, such as flagging, uh, I believe remain at the core of user acceptance and trust of any government or public service database. And I mention that because I know that in many countries, getting the public to accept the use of ID cards, of uh, computer databases and e-services is a huge problem. The public doesn't want to do it. Um, and you would think that a country like mine, which, had, uh, which in fact went through uh, an Orwellian 50 years, would be most averse to all these kinds of things. But in fact, if you do a good job of convincing people that they're safe, uh, people will go along with it. But in, sh in short, for societies to be competitive, societies and countries need to be able to rely on ICT. But for democratic size societies to tolerate and go along with these processes, IT solutions, A, must be decentralized, B, citizens' data must, be <coughs> must legally belong to him or her with complete access to all of one's own data, a sine qua non, and C, access to others must be strictly siloed, i.e., that is to say, accessible only to those with a legal right to see that, see the data, which implies in turn strict monitoring of those accessing other people's data combined with strict penalties for those who violate the privacy of, a, of citizens' data. And in other words, it's, you can't just get a slap on your hand. You have to go to jail. And now finally, let me talk about a little, little greater length about really the, um, the one... Um, the one problem that we often uh, don't talk enough about when we uh, have discussions about how wonderful all these e-services are, and that's the sort of security, the hard security side of issue, um, and that's the real, I think, the real, uh, sec the, the real risk when we talk about ICT use in government and in public services. That's real security, sec cyber attacks, malware, hacking. Especially since the more we rely on information technology in our daily lives to run governments, the more vulnerable we are. As we in Estonia discovered with the massive DDoS attacks on our public and private ITC infrastructure in 2007. Cybersecurity is today's growth field with no better testimonial to that for us than, the, than that uh, both NATO's Cooperative Cyber Defense Center and the European Union's Home and Justice Affairs Data Center are located in Tallinn. I think the, the cyber attacks and the, those two things being here are also related to each other politically. Yet I, and I would argue that this is an area where we cannot isolate the government from the private sector. 
Indeed, we need to realize that our, realize that our vulnerabilities in government and the public sector are intertwined with vulnerabilities in the private sector. All the more so since attacks on our government systems as well as our private sector are themselves produced by new public-private partnerships, in quotes, where mafia or other groups contract them themselves out to or work hand-in-hand -hand with governments to, a hack, to hack, attack, and to disrupt. Slowly, it is moreover dawning on us that cyber wars do not have to hit state and civilian infrastructure, but rather our economies through piracy. That in fact, perhaps we are too fixated on the militarization of cyber rather than on state-sponsored theft. For technologically advanced countries, including my own, with Tallinn as the research and develop center of our flagship company, Skype, it is the theft of intellectual property that can in fact cripple or at least severely wound our economies. Let's be sure about this. Much of what makes modern economies function and prosper is the product of huge, huge R&D investments, both public and private. The European Union has set a goal for its member states to invest 3% of GDP into research and development, a goal few meet, but then again, few also meet the NATO goal of defense expenditures of 2% of GDP. Much of the democratic West primacy up till now has rested on innovation, on new designs, be they pharmaceutical products, software solutions, or whatever. A company that invests hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars or euros in new products can see it all evaporate if the research is stolen. The value of the product comes from those years of creative work and dollars and euros invested in developing it. Yet, it can all be stolen and in a matter of seconds, and in fact, we have lots of cases where it is simply sucked out in a matter of microseconds. At which point, someone, <clears throat> someone else, somewhere else, has gotten for free what your country's best and brightest spent years to develop. You lose, as a country, the tax revenue, or you as the government, and someone else reaps the profits. This is piracy. Pure and simple, and it is as dangerous and threatening for modern states as piracy in its more primitive forms off the Barbary Coast was at the beginning of the 19th century, or in fact today off the coast of Somalia. As is the case with classical maritime piracy, intellectual piracy is not only a threat to our economies, it is also a threat that falls into the category of public-private partnership, where state actors condone or turn a blind eye to it or even perhaps pay for it if it benefits their economies, just as it <coughs> was beneficial to the Barbary states under Ottoman rule. And as with the Barbary pirates, cyber attacks against our companies can be met head-on only with the cooperative and concerted state action. Today, the public-private partnership paradigm that we see in both militarized cyber warfare of the botnet type as well as in the systematic theft of our company's intellectual property should give us pause to rethink our own relations with the private sector. That is the relationship that we and the government have with our companies. I recently shared a talk and a panel discussion with Carl Bildt, uh, the uh, foreign minister of Sweden, uh, on cybersecurity at the Royal Defense University in Stockholm, where during the question and answer, the head of cybersecurity for Sony Ericsson stood up and asked point blank, why are you, the government people, not sharing with us? We are attacked just as much as you and probably more. Well, I can't say who was attacked more, but he made his point and in fact made me rethink my views on cybersecurity. A few weeks later, I asked the then head of cybersecurity for the British Minister, Ministry of Defense, Dame Polly Neville Jones, why the UK had suddenly, after a number of years of completely ignoring the issue, taken such an outspoken position on the need to work jointly on cyber defense. Her answer was more or less the same. Our companies are coming under massive attack. 
What I suspect, although I can't at this time say how, is but we will in the future have to work, in the future have to rethink government-private sector relations. We in the liberal democratic West, in countries with low scores on the Transparency International Corruption Index, that's a good score, low score, have built a solid firewall between the private and public sectors. Even the term public-private partnership attests to the relative separation of the two sectors. No such separation in mercantilistic or authoritarian kleptocratic regimes exists. I'll say that again, just so you get the point. No separation between the public and private sphere in mercantilistic or authoritarian kleptocratic regimes exists. One serves the other, and vice versa. Yet if the basis of our relative economic success, our private sector, is coming under attack from state actors, we have to come up with new ways of talking to and sharing with the private sector. This, of course, will run against the grain of how we have been doing, doing things for years and years. But we do need to address this problem. As I see it, there are two issues. One, we need to come up with new ways to talk to talk to the private sector. Security clearances, sharing of sensitive information in both directions from government to private sector and vice versa needs to be made far less ad hoc, far more based on rules that will allow us a greater deal of flexibility to face new threats without at the same time allowing the crony capitalism that destroys democracies. This is not an easy issue. I mean, if we're going to start working together with the private sector or if the private sector is going to start working to get more closely with us, we're going to be facing all of, those, all of those problems that we see in corrupt countries where governments and, and the uh, private sector get merged, or where the government is doing the bidding of the companies, or where the companies are doing the work of the government. Um, the success of the liberal democratic West has been to, to create the legal firewalls. And I fear that with the kinds of attacks we are getting, we will have to start coming up with new solutions. And that worries me, actually. Secondly, we on the state side of things uh, have one more problem. That is, we no longer can afford the brains. The, we can no longer afford the brains on the private side of cyber. Let's face it, Estonia's government cannot pay for the genius software developers of Skype. On the other hand, it's not that we're so poor because when I went to the U.S., you know, I was told the U.S. Department of Defense and Cyber Command um, can't, uh, doesn't have the money to hire the top guns at Apple, Microsoft, or Google either. The other side, the bad guys can. Not from a Apple, but I mean... <laughs> And that's, a, that's also a big change in society, because in the old days, before cyber, before computers, uh, you could, the governments could hire the best and the brightest because they were university professors, and you can pay them just as much as they were in university. So if you had Edward Teller um, or Robert Oppenheimer in developing the atom bomb, uh, you know, you could even pay him a little more than he got, they got paid at Columbia. Um, I went to Columbia, by the way, so low salary. <laughs> But it's just a professor's salary. But today, you want to get the, the equivalent, um, the equivalent of an Ed, a cyber equivalent of an Edward Teller. Uh, no government can afford him or her. So this puts governments at a distinct disadvantage in developing cyber defense, because we can't afford necessarily the best and the brightest. One solution, which I can offer to you people, which I would highly recommend, uh, we've come up with here in Estonia, which is we do, we've created, uh, I guess what would be in uh, English, depending on your, your term for it, a cyber home guard or a cyber national guard. Uh, these are weekend warriors with ponytails. S uh, computer geeks who have high paying jobs, day jobs, work running IT departments, uh, working at software companies and banks, who find it cool to volunteer for their country. We offer them the opportunity to help with our defense, and they get the opportunity to help their country, and they like it. 
So not exactly running around in the woods in camouflage suits, uh, which is what National Guards generally do on weekends, mm, but rather building our cyber defense capability. Today, lest you think it's, I mean, it's, we're a small country. We have 150 volunteer computer experts at the, uh, in the Cyber Defense League, but it is nonetheless not a bad number for a country with a military of 4,000. These people are motivated and patriotic and, and agree that it is sexy to work on these things. Um, we're only starting on this, it's been going for about a year, but I mentioned this initiative is the kind of creative solution that we need to begin to consider to be able to guarantee the highly, guarantee uh, the security of the highly sophisticated e-services as well as the research and, research and development driven companies that a modern society depends on. When threats are no longer classic threats, our responses can no longer be classic either, at least if we want to maintain the upper hand. So ladies and gentlemen, in closing, I must admit that I've no doubt raised far more issues than I've answered, probably more questions, but my intent was to point out in broad brushstrokes how different the world of the public and the world of the public and government sector has become with ICT. We have wonderful new tools to solve old problems. We can develop innovative solutions that improve the lives of millions of our citizens. <clears throat> and we have discovered, too, some decidedly unwonderful threats and new problems. Estonia's experience in the past 20 years reflect this. We became pioneers in the use of ICT in government first because it seemed the best, if not the only way, to leapfrog decades of backwardness caused by awful Soviet rule. Information technology and its use in the public sector as well as the private became the engine of our rapid development and enabled us to become a leader offering innovative solutions that we gladly offer to others, and we do, and we have programs all over the world, and our X-Road system is being taken up by various governments. I think uh, the Palestinian, th Palestinian Authority even is, is going to do it. And almost as if on cue, we also became the world's first victim of purposive, directed, massive attacks against a nation's public ICT infrastructure, and thence one of the world's centers of cyber defense and security. But nonetheless, we are e-believers. We are proud of being pioneers in e-government, and we are convinced that a public sector information communication technology approach that is citizen-centered, secure, and transparent is the future of all good governance in the 20th century. Thank you.